Okay, hello and welcome to What's Up with Startups. I'm Emin Asker, the host of the show, and today with me is Olivier Musat of Atome, if I pronounce the Atomic. Atome is perfectly pronounced. Thank you, Emin. Thank you. Welcome to the show, Olivier, and thank you for having you for having me here. Pleasure to be here. Okay. So Olivier, your company is uh, fascinating to me because you work in in the hydrogen economy and the hydrogen industry. And um I haven't been haven't had the chance to work in that industry, but I'm fascinated uh, by it also actually because of the contradictions that the industry usually uh, demonstrates when I'm trying to look deeper in it. And so I was very happy when you agreed to participate in the podcast. And that's the reason number one. And the reason number two is because you are the first company on this podcast that went through IPO. So and that was quite recent. And mm -hmm. um, let me just kick, we will come to the IPO soon enough, but let's just kick off by a short introduction from you just to tell uh, our listeners and viewers what your company do. And no, you... of course. Uh, so I guess a little bit about me. I studied as a field engineer commissioning uh, gas-fired power plants, um, working on water treatment in chemical facilities um, with uh, what was then called uh, GE uh, Power and Water. Um, then moved to Schlumberger, obviously oil and gas service company, um, working uh, across uh, Middle East, uh, Europe, and Africa. So um, that was my first, let's say, real hard experience on emerging markets. Um, and, and really going deep down into the oil and gas industry. Um, then I moved into banking with Standard Chartered Bank based in London, again, uh, doing a lot of financing uh, in uh, energy, oil and gas, LNG facilities um, across, uh, well, actually across the world, but mostly emerging markets. And, and then I did that for about four years and change. And, and then I joined the IFC, the private investment arm of the World Bank, uh, where first in the oil and gas team as CIO, that was roughly a $2 billion uh, portfolio of debt and equity assets. Um, and then in 2017, um, as a World Bank strategy, uh, decided to uh, basically lower the exposure and the investment in oil and gas and increase them in renewables. So, um, so we merged oil and gas and power and became the energy group. Um, and within this energy group, uh, obviously, you had you know wind, solar, uh, but then the new kids on the block, which were um, battery storage and hydrogen. Uh, and so um, we were able to invest in early stage VC, um, uh, let's say corporate, and of course, you know even the financing side of the equation. Uh, but it was during that time that it was really about okay, what are we trying to achieve, which is really decarbonize the hard to abate side of the equation, you know, decarbonizing electrons. Now we know how to do it, you know, with, uh, it's relatively mature, but how do you decarbonize the chemical side of the business? You know, the, the fuel, uh, the, the, the plastics, the, the heavy goods, you know, transport um, and, you know, fertilizers especially. So, um, so it's during that time as I was, um, you know, with a team maturing, um, what were the best opportunities uh, where we could use hydrogen to decarbonize uh, various sectors um, that we kind of created, let's say, a, a, a formula and approached a number of former clients and um, and which I approached one of our former clients, uh, which was then called President Energy, um, which was an oil and gas company with presence in Latin America, who was also exploring um, to basically leverage existing renewable power to make hydrogen and then obviously to um, to sell the hydrogen, but obviously not in hydrogen form, uh, much more into the chemical form of you know, ammonia and fertilizers. So um, during the maturing of that strategy, um, I was offered the opportunity to, to basically join the company, which became Atom. Um, and uh, that was what, three years ago now, um, time flies. And, um, and so we then, Obviously, created at home, um, worked on the first assets, spun it out for a number of reasons we'll get into, and um, and it's been quite an adventure ever since. And and we've seen, you know, we are still very 
early stage for a number of reasons, because obviously the hydrogen economy is fascinating for a number of points. Um, but uh, we are still the first and only company listed, uh, which is dedicated on using hydrogen to make green fertilizers as the end product. Okay, so that was it's quite a career pivot, I would say. You come from uh, uh, the oil and gas industry background, and then you go into the IFC, the banking sector, and then you leave that, I would expect to be quite comfortable and uh, and actually a position of power as well. And you go into all out into the startup. What motivated you? Um, so I think first of all, it's, it's, you know, you have to have a bit of a curious mind and, and every single, let's say, I wouldn't call them so much pivot, but growing um, was really about, you know, what's next, what's, what's really the next bit. And, you know, when I moved to, you know, the oil and, from power to oil and gas was really, you know, okay, how it's great to do power, but, you know, where do these molecules come from? What are the dynamics of the global market? Then the pivot from oil and gas into the financing side, which is, okay, how do you finance these billion dollar projects, both on the debt and the equity side? And the IFC is an incredible place to work. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've left now for a while, but I still love it for a number of reasons, mostly the people. It's it's one of these places which really opens your mind and allows you to try a number of things. Um, but what I realized there is you can have impact working with very, very large projects, but the most impact you can have is if you create a market. And today, you're using hydrogen to make fertilizer or green hydrogen to make green fertilizer doesn't exist. But you know what? Um, fertilizers represent more carbon than shipping and uh, aviation combined. And nobody's taking care of it, right? So there was an interesting challenge that none of the big boys were taking care of. Um, and then another point was, it was during um, you know us talking about the hydrogen strategy with a number of very large players, you know some of the biggest utilities in the world, and you realize that it's very difficult for large institutions to 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 move things, to create new things. And and at that point, I thought that I could have more impact um, in in helping accelerate. Uh, some of the hydrogen transition, but especially using the fertilizer sector as, as you know, something an existing sector which needs to be decarbonized, which is also extremely key because you and I can choose to take a flight to go on a holiday or or, or just to do a Zoom instead of instead of meeting in person. Uh, but when it comes to fertilizers, you know, nobody has a choice. You know, we we need fertilizers to eat, right? So so the size of the challenge and the importance of the challenge is super exciting. Um, is it uncomfortable? Yeah, hundred percent, completely uncomfortable. Um, but it was, you know, at that time where I wanted to put all of the skills I've learned into creating something new. Yeah, I would like to just a little bit pause here for the second. You said that to have an impact, uh, and uh, when I was preparing for this call, I checked on your website on Atomi that your first project um, in Paraguay. Uh, we'll be able to knock off like half a million tons of CO2 per year. I mean, just replace that and take that out of the equation, which is a, which is about 1% of the total man-made emissions, I think. And oh, it's, it's a, no, no, it's a, it's a lot lower than that, right? Oh. But I think on a, um, you know, if you think the um, fertilizer sector is, you know, 2.6 gigaton, right? It's roughly... Um, uh, billion tons, sorry, I always get my things confused. Um, it's less than 5% of the world's consumption yeah. of, I mean, creation of carbon, right? But it's it's still huge, right? Um, so we we have a very, 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 very small number out of that. Like we are maybe 0.01%. Uh, but it, it's the first step, right? It's kind of, a, that's the whole idea. It's like you have to create this thing so that it, it goes, so the potential is indeed to get to that one percent. I yes, um, that's that's the ambition of what we are trying to create. But the first project will be relatively small. Um, but still, our first project represents one percent of all of the fertilizers uh, derived from nitrates used in uh, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. So it's not nothing for the region. Um, and uh, yes, the ambitions are there. Uh, and importantly, it's not using any new technology, right? It is completely durable, but getting the business right is really the challenge. 
So you had then to apply your uh, experience in finance, I would imagine, uh, to get that initial funding, which I think uh, what I've checked uh, on the on the web and on the pitch book is that you had initial funding, which was immediately IPO, right? And uh, how did you decide to go for that? I mean, most of the startups, even when they are very hardware intensive, they don't go immediately for IPO. They raise some, they do the private race, seed, pre-seed, whatever. So they yeah. really, you know, struggle to uh, amass that assets and capital before they actually go for the IPO. But in your case, it was the other way around. So I'm curious to learn what was the motivation I and mean, why did you say that this is the best way to go for it? So because we were incubated within an oil and gas company and, um, you know, by our chairman, Peter, and, uh, and, and that company was called President Energy then. Mm -hmm. and, and what we saw was that, yes, you know, clearly the public markets have, you know, are not perfect, far from that, right? It's not, you have to be at a certain level of maturity. So what we had done is we spent nearly, I mean, let's say nine months maturing the business, being incubated within this oil and gas company. Um, and, and obviously these are large projects, you know, we're talking of CapEx of, you know, $400 million plus for the first project. Um, and what we have basically decided to do by going public very early was obviously one side raising money, um, you know, not a huge amount, but enough for development costs. Uh, but what we saw, especially as you are working in emerging markets in relatively new sectors, it helps accelerate your credibility, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the utilities that we are discussing with. You know, we have obviously long-term power purchase agreement, uh, mm -hmm. long-term offtake agreements, product suppliers, you name it. So it's it's a way to accelerate a number of things, which, as you say, need take time to build, right? And and if you are public, you've basically done your KYC, your transparency. Uh, a lot of the processes that take a lot of time for younger companies to get through so that they become acceptable to lenders, to investors. Um, that is work that you do upfront, um, which is worth it. Um, it also gives you a bit more flexibility. Is it is it the only route? No, absolutely not, right? You, we, I can think of a few companies who are trying to do something not that dissimilar from what we are, but who are backed by large private equities. Um, but, you know, these have also their pluses and minuses. Um, so for us, it was an accelerator of growth uh, that comes with some pain, uh, but was enabled uh, by, our, by our principal shareholder um, and, uh, and by where we were incubated at. So not everybody can, you know, can be in the same position as us, but at the same time, not every, you shouldn't be scared with the right people, with the right team, to look at IPO market as as actually a pretty credible one, um, and uh, but you know things comes and go, right? So a few years ago, public markets had you know you could raise a hundred million dollars on a piece of paper. Uh, today, public markets in London are very you know very weak, but the private markets are very strong. So it's all about trying to figure out for your company the stages where you are in, and very importantly the team that you have. Can you actually handle it? Because you know, an IPO takes a lot of time and takes a lot of resources, certain skill sets as well. And thankfully, you know, um, you know, we were, we are, we have investors and we have a chairman who has done it a number of times before. So it was part of a skill set of a company to be able to do that. You mentioned several times the team. Who I would imagine, if I guess that the team was your key uh, instrument, your key. Uh, reason for success in going for the IPO? Would I be correct? I mean, you absolutely no, no. You're, you're absolutely correct, and but it's true even in private investments, right? Even in um, maybe not Series A, but definitely Series Bs and beyond. Um, you know, the joke, and it's not a joke; it's a reality where you know you can have um, the best idea in the world. If you don't have a good team, it will not go anywhere. And and if you have a very good team. But a new idea isn't great, but it's good enough. You know, you guess what? You will make something out of that investment. And me, when I was an investor, um, it was always that. It was, you know, looking for management teams, people who were complementary, um, and uh, and so that you don't rely on just one person. 
right? You have to have uh, the skill sets which are um, uh, complementary to each other. You know, in our team, you know, we have obviously, you know, a majority share shareholder who, who comes from a very strong operational background. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, who had done a number of IPOs before. Um, I'm a bit of a mix, but, you know, that said, I've financed billions of dollars of assets uh, and and both on debt and equity side. So that's definitely something I know what to do and what to expect. Um, we've added Myros de Valadares, who um, is, was for 15 years the head of the International Energy Agency's Hydrogen Partnership Unit. Um, we've added, you know, Terry Bakken, who was the head of uh, EVP for Eurochem and Yara, which were the largest fertilizer companies in the world. Um, Jim Spaulding, who's our head for Paraguay, who used to run the hydro hydroelectric dam, who used to be Minister of Finance. So it's all about having these people who are, you know, very, very strong foundation to the pyramid you are trying to build. So what you, here in you, I see that you had, uh, so if, if I kind of paraphrase it back to you, because I think it's an important point because when you, when as a founder uh, or as a CEO of a startup, you assemble the team. So what you did, you, you got the people, you got a very strong backing on the IPO side. So people who are your major shareholder who can, who did this, the same thing several times before. And you got people with extensive contacts in hydrogen industry and the knowledge base and then you also added that the local con uh, the, the, the the local team so the ex ceo of, of this hydropower uh company and then also and then uh, and the market right? and the market yes. yeah and the market yeah so okay and is this the reason your team is quite small i mean you're actually on on both on linkedin and pitchbook it's about dozens of people yeah, that's correct. I mean, because it, from a startup point of view, and you know, three years later, we are still considering ourselves as a startup, right? Where you you have to be very mindful that you know cash doesn't last forever, and and you don't want to start burning and over hiring at a point you don't need. What you have, however, is a number of institutions that can support you, and so they don't have to be staff, but they are, let's say, on the consulting side, and. Which is why very early on we chose ACOM, uh, which is one of the largest, uh, you know, uh, power uh, contract EPC contractor in the world. Uh, you know, it's I cannot remember how many people it is, but let's just say it was fifty thousand people worldwide, right? So it's it's a big elephant. So it's and 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 by hiring ACOM, you have access to hundreds of engineers, right? And so you you can find the right one instead of trying to hire them in house um, and. As you are early stage, of course, you know it's very difficult to have one person who is a specialist on, uh, you know, let's say electrolyzer uh, 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 manufacturing, or one person who is a specialist for um, substations or transmission. It doesn't really make sense because they will not busy be busy fifty hours a week every single week. Um, and it's the same thing also, you know, in some part of the financial services, right? Finding the right PR firm you can work with, uh, finding the right brokers you can work with. So it's this is how you become more efficient and remain, let's say, GNA light, because what you will see is it's, it's what's very important is whatever business plan you had, it is going to overrun, right? That, that's, that's, that's a certainty, right? So it's going to take longer and it's going to take more expensive. So control what you can control. And guess what? Staff is the first thing you can control. So make sure you have, when you spend the time early, early on, building the right people, building the right staff who can take on three, four, five things um, and then direct traffic as needed. And because otherwise, you know, um, what you end up is a, a very early on bloated organization and you have to do, let's say, series A, series B, series C. Um, but guess what? You know, if if Series C is just because you have a massive cost overrun and you are late, your valuation is going to have a real hard problem, right? So all of the good work you would have done on A and B would mm -hmm. have been completely diluted by C. Okay, but then still, I mean, you you are now into uh, deep into engineering phase, as I understand of your project, mm -hmm. and um, you plan to that is a saw that you plan to complete the engineering phase this year mm -hmm. and get like the final approval for the project so that you can start construction. Mm -hmm. 
uh, from my experience working with this engineering companies, working with the EPC contractor, it pays to have uh, your own kind of uh, owner's engineer, I don't know, or, or your own engineer who is, you know, capable of doing the same thing. At least, okay, he doesn't have to be, you know, specialized in substations or something, but he has to have a good general understanding of what these projects are like and where are the loopholes, where are the potential pitfalls, what to look out for and how to control the your subcontract, basically. Correct. No, absolutely. And and this is the rule that ACOM has, right? Basically, they are our own owner's engineer, hmm. uh, project manager who will be managing, you know, Obas and Castale, right? So, for example, when we did the selection process for front engineering and design, right? We designed it with ACOM together. Um, and we spent a lot of time interviewing and running through the feed, pre feed, feed process. And, and, making sure that whoever was winning the feed could take on, but not mm -hmm. necessarily must take on the EPC. Mm -hmm. So always having the discipline to keep everybody honest. I think, and for project one, you have to be much more conservative. You know, project two, you can build your internal team. Absolutely. Because, you know, let, let's, let's be honest, you are leaving percentages of IRR by subcontracting some of the owner's engineer side. Um, but at least it will be done right the first time because for us, the entire goal is that project one becomes a blueprint and that project two will be 10% cheaper than project one and project three, 10% cheaper than project two. Um, and then you do that by building your own internal capacity as well. So it's, uh, it's indeed, it's always this push and pull and finding the right people who are also aligned with you, right? If I just have an owner's engineer who takes his salary or his fee um, and then, you know, goodbye, it's not very good alignment of incentives, right? So your, you know, you guys, your engineers have to be incentivized to success as well. And, and you notice, and as you know, very well, you know, whilst the entrepreneurs, um, and even the equity guys have a strong, um, risk, uh, based view of the world and, and they take uh, assumptions. Um, it's not in the engineer's DNA, you know, engineers like to know where they are going and, and they don't really care about a hundred percent bonus. Right? They really want to make sure that can I deliver this? This is my target. If I delivered on my target, did I get this? And that's it. So creating uh, and aligning incentives, especially for young uh, companies, is very very important. I would imagine that would be your job as a CEO. I, my job goes from this to talking to the market to taking out the trash. Right. So, <laughs> okay. How do you ensure this alignment of incentive in your case? How, what, what do you look for? Uh, because, okay, the small team you have is one thing. You have to ensure alignment of incentive there. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that's no easy task because you have a, like a very heavy hitters on your team. Mm -hmm. And um, the it, it, it's a bit like, you know, uh, uh, sorry for comparison. Uh, when the Oppenheimer was charged with his, uh, with the nuclear project. So he had this team, you know, a lot of very, bright scientists, the best that U.S. could offer, but they would all be, you know, very um, self-confident and they would be sure that they know everything, but they had to work with the same people, you know, and, they, and often they would disagree. So the Oppenheimer, he, Oppenheimer, he had the management case before him, you know, how to get these people work together. <laughs> um, so from this small team of the heavy hitters to the, say, your subcontractors who yeah. are supposed to work in your interest, like your consultants or your mm -hmm. uh, owners engineer, how do you ensure this alignment of incentives? So, I mean, if, you know, I mean, obviously talking about what, what's been in the public domain. So, you know, we have Baker Hughes as an investor in the company, right? And Baker Hughes is, is, is a strong company, um, very strong company um, with a lot of experience in compressors and valves um, around uh, basically the chemical industry, but, you know, even LNG and hydrogen. And, and the reason they became an investor is they were really interested to go and, you know, us having one of the first projects, really bankable projects out there, was, um, you know, they wanted to basically say, hey, you know, how do I make sure that when you guys come for FID, when you come for order, that I can be first in line, right? Yeah. And so we say that, well, you can, but, you know, then you have to show some goodwill, you know, put some money on the table, not a lot, but just enough for us to know. And then, you know, obviously looking at a, 
a treatment which makes sure that yes, you will have absolutely priority, but not blank check priority, right? We have to make sure you can deliver on time, on spec, on cost, right? Because otherwise you become hostage to someone. So, so this takes a lot of time contractually. Yes, right, it does. Um, but also you have, let's say, other uh, you know, clients where you just have to find uh, you know, what, what is it that their skill set is and where do we fit? Because we are unique in some cases where we don't believe in gigawatt projects for hydrogen is way too early. Um, the same thing that if you look at you know, the, the fertilizer side, if you go, it's, it's a sector which is now you know, an average oil and gas or gas-based fertilizer factory makes about a million tons a year. Mm-hmm. And that's really like, you know, base base. And KBR and Fluor are fantastic at that stuff. Um, but obviously, what our first plant is going to do about 200 and, you know, 250 to 270,000 tons a year. So it's smaller than what's available today. And mm-hmm. and this is why, you know, in the end, we have chosen Casale because there's not that many um, engineering firms who are very good at doing things on the smaller end, right? So... Mm-hmm. They are a good fit to work for us, but also, uh, you know, we are a good fit for them, right? Because mm-hmm. it's a business they want to grow. So they also align because if they can do one project su- successful with us and it's the first in kind, then, you know, they can also basically go out to the market and say, hey, I've done this thing for these guys, you know, can I do it for you in India, the US, in Holland, you name it, right? So that's how you keep them aligned and everybody's aligned for success. You know, the motivation is not always about money, right? It's also about the alignment of interest and the future of a business. Okay, great. Thanks. So you really got the team, not only, I mean, the team, which is your core team, but also the team of your support companies that are around this project who also, for them, it's also a challenge and they they want to address that, you know, to, to be the first Absolutely. I mean, you have to keep people interested at the end of the day, right? So, because yeah, if you're just doing another, I don't know, let's say a uh, gas pipeline, you know, what, what's, what's the motivation? You know, you're going to look at people and you say, well, who do I have, you know, available today in, let, let's say, Azerbaijan? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, you know, we've been doing it for 20 years. We know that the price for one kilometer of pipeline is Azerbaijan is X. Okay, you know, I will, I will bid, you know, X minus 1%, so I know that I will win the project. And that's it, right? So it's it's one way to look at things. Um, but uh, when you are a young company, this is not the type of partners you need. Okay, great. Um, speaking about um, hydrogen uh, in general, I mean, when I look at the hydrogen projects and I've done some research recently for a client of my phone, hydrogen scene, I see that the projects in hydrogen usually suffer, you know, they have... Uh, there's lack of offtakes, there's high prices for hydrogen, and at the same time, abnormally high investor confidence. What was your approach to working with this in your project? So I think the this is why it's useful to have people who come from the sector, like Maya Rose and, and some of us in the energy sector, right? It's um, Hydrogen comes back every 10 to 15 years as the next big thing, and it mm. never materialized, right? And, and you have fundamental reasons for it. Um, one of the last fundamental reason was obviously the price of power um, because it's extremely hungry. Green hydrogen is very hungry for power uh, to simplify it, right? Um, and it's an oversimplification, but you'll get a sense. You know, to make hydrogen today, you take methane. So, you, I mean, you take CH4 and you break the C and the H4, right? So you've broken, you know, your, uh, your gas and you have four units of hydrogen. Um, the way to do it with power, with for green uh, green hydrogen, is use renewable power to break the H2O molecule, mm-hmm. and and that is a much much harder bond to break. So it takes a lot more energy. So on a basic, on like for like, it takes a lot more energy and is much more expensive to break to make green hydrogen than gray hydrogen from the methane. So if you are an engineer, you say, this is a stupid idea. Why should I use a method which is less, uh, let's say, less efficient than what is already existing? And from a chemistry point of view, I'm not disagreeing, right? The problem is if I break CH4, I've got a big C, which is now going somewhere. Mm -hmm. If I take H2O, 
I have an O, which is going somewhere. And the O has zero climate impact. The other side is, if the renewable power is cheap enough, I don't care about efficiency, right? Because it's just a question of price at the end of the day. The problem that you have is that a lot of promises were made assuming a very low cost of power, which is very hard to make, right? A very low cost of renewable power at the end of the day needs a lot of investments, except in some of the right places. And our strategy very early on was we don't want to work with subsidies. Or we want to avoid subsidies as much as possible. Um, we know that cheap power is hard. And if you look at all of the um, projections on hydrogen from um, IRENA, I-R-E-N-A, mm -hmm. which is the EIA equivalent for the renewable sector, uh, if you looked at the small print, they said, assuming $20 per megawatt hour, which mm -hmm. is very, very, very difficult to get. Then you look at the technical side of things. You know, we've had electrolyzers for 100 years now, um, and which is alkaline electrolyzers. And mm -hmm. you have new tech, which has been um, pushed push forward, called PEM, uh, called SOEC, but this is less than 10-year-old tech. Um, and so if you want to use the old tech, you need very cheap power, and you need baseload hydroelectric power. Um, so that you can be competitive when you're going to be producing your hydrogen with a competition. So number one, make sure your price of hydrogen will remain low. Number two, it will have very low risk attached to it, very low tech risk. Because up until three years ago, two years ago, the biggest one uh, facility, green, green hydrogen facility in operation was 20 megawatt. Mm -hmm. And people are talking gigawatt, right? So the, the step from 20 to a gig is massive, right? So supply side. Now there's the demand side. Um, which for us, just like everybody talks about hydrogen, well, how much demand is there for hydrogen really? Right? Not that much. Right? It's an industrial gas. That's what it is. Um, yeah. So, you know, yes, we look at it for, you know, in refinery, it's important. In mobility, it's tiny, 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 and, and it's expensive to put together. Um, but what you realize is that actually most of the market is for ammonia, and 80% of the ammonia market is to fertilizers. So which was for us, we say, okay, there's an existing market, which is the fertilizer market. Let's start with that. Then you can go into shipping and all of these things. So how do you make reliable, cheap supply? And how do you have a product which is then competitive on a global market where there's a market today and doesn't have to wait for hydrogen buses to be created? So it's putting, excuse me, a lot of realism right into the structure. Um, you know, we are not a tech company. This is not our business, right? We know that at the end of the day, this is chemicals. This is this is margins, right? Everybody mm -hmm. who's worked in the chemical industry knows that, you know, it's everybody's fighting for that last quarter of a percent. So, um, which unfortunately, when you look at people who do startups and tech, everybody's thinking, oh, I'm going to make 10x, 100x. Just like, no, like, how do you make sure you can produce it cheaper than your neighbor? That's the only thing you should be worried about. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of the conversation. I just have um, I have three more questions for you. Maybe we can uh, uh, just shortly answer them. So the first one is, okay, so you are past the PO, you are in engineering phase. What's your next big challenge and how you want to tackle it? So the next big challenge is on the financing side, and we are very lucky, we've had a lot of support from the Texas, um, and we have a lot of support from the Inter-American Development Bank because our project is climate positive and relates to food security, right? If I think, you know, uh, we've known and we've for a while that we had over relied on specific sources of fertilizer, which are not going to be available in the future. Um, so for us, the next challenge is as we get to FID, is putting the financing package together. So we are very well advanced, um, but there's still more work to be done um, because obviously the lenders need to be persuaded that our project is low risk, competitive globally, um, and, and will be producing within three years of FID. And, uh, and obviously the equity investors, so what we call construction equity at the end of the day, um, where you don't do that at the IPO level, right? This is money that comes from bringing in other large investors like you do in oil and gas. You know, if you do, let's say you have exploration companies mm -hmm. and then you have development companies. An exploration company goes out, you know, a license, goes for an exploration well and then brings in a big partner. 
right? To, so for us, it is very much a very similar strategy. And, and again, we are well advanced there. Um, then the other stage will be just to start replicating, you know, what we are doing. So which is why we are working hard in Costa Rica, uh, working on it phase three, but focus, focus, focus. And we have to get project one to FID because until you get project one to FID, everything else is just an Excel spreadsheet or a PowerPoint slide. Okay, great. Uh, if you could go back like in time when you started this, like three years ago or any time in the last three years, would there be anything which you would do differently? Um, it's a really diff yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, would they have been? Um, hmm. Everything that we've done was with a specific reason, like we looked at mobility for a while, you know, as a way to learn. And, and we learned along the way, and it wasn't cheap to learn, um, that, uh, that essentially, like we were five years too early on mobility. That was very clear. Um, so would we do this again? I'm not sure, because we wouldn't have learned things which would be, you know, would make the rest of our projects much cheaper. Um, the approach to the capital markets would have been a bit different, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bringing uh, or trying to educate, let's say, some of the large investors earlier, because uh, I have to admit, I think we were quite surprised by how much education we had to do. Mm -hmm. And and on one hand, we want to be very systematic in how we approach things. It's it's a, it's a risk based analysis where, for example, we did not want to talk to off takers on fertilizer until we knew exactly every single element of the tech and the costs because you have to know what you're negotiating, right? And if you don't know the cost of your plant, it's difficult to negotiate the offtake. Um, but that's the type of things where we would have accelerated some of these conversations to have them in parallel. Um, I would say, would it have helped fundamentally? Not 100% sure, um, but certainly it's something that we would have done a little bit different because we were surprised by the amount of education we had to do, that's clear. Okay. Great. And the final question from this experience that you have uh, with this, uh, with Atoma, uh, with uh, this startup, and what would you recommend other green tech startups who are starting out on the growth path? Oof. Uh, I think it's pretentious to say I can recommend anything. Uh, all I want to say is look at risks and simplify, right? Where one of the examples, one of the thing I hated as an investor is having a management team in front of me who say, I have this great idea. I want to keep 50% of a project for me, but I expect you to put 100% of, of the money up front, right? So, so very often, you know, like the joke is, you know, love your projects, but don't fall in love with your projects. No. So you have to be very, very realistic. Um, the other side, and that's something that I have seen in a number of these type of situations, much more in the VC world, I would say, um, it's much more the, um, you know, uh, let's say, you know, it's radical vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> and it's focus on execution, 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 execution. That's very, very important. So bring the team that is a capable of execution. Exactly, and understand that, right? Unfortunately, you know, some people think that money appears from trees. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Olivia. This is a really insightful conversation. It's the first time I hear, like, the, I, I myself did two big startups, which also required a lot of investment, but lately I was focusing more on the smaller companies, and it's um, very inspiring to see that, you know, you, you can actually do a big one, uh, which could put a serious, uh, reach a serious milestone, I would say, in uh, in climate in the climate sector. Well, thank you, Emin. I mean, as, as you know, it's 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 not easy, so it's nice to have support uh, of people like you. And and you know, we uh, you know we we have champions, and 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 we need we need champions to continue pushing our story, uh, because as I say, you know, the more people know about us, the more likely we'll be uh, to be successful. Thank you very much, Olivia, for this conversation. And it was great to have you here. And um, hope to speak to you soon. And good luck to Atom. Thank you, Emin. Thank you. Have a nice day.